Welcome to the show, everybody. Before we get to our interview today with Mark Robinson, guitarist for the band Unrest and creator of the Teen Beat Records label, I want to make you aware of a special offer happening soon because of photographer and publisher Chris Henderson, a recent guest on the show. His website, xushots.com, which is an independent publishing company specializing in vintage and contemporary media about the Washington, D.C. punk rock scene, has created a limited edition Jams for Man t-shirt featuring the Jams for Man can logo designed by local artist Ed Sue on an army green background. So go out and get one starting November 22nd at xushots.com slash shop. Because only 24 were made, and they're going to sell out fast. And as always, thank you for listening to Jams for Man and supporting the local Northern Virginia music scene. Now to my conversation with musician, artist, label owner, and now film director, Mark Robinson. Mark. Hello. Yes. Mark. Hey, it works. Andy. <laughs> so you are from Virginia, but now you live in Los Angeles? Yes. I am from okay. Reston originally. So were you, are you originally from Virginia yourself? I am from originally the New York area, um, but my parents got divorced. And me and my mom and my sister moved to Arlington, uh, I think when I was, I think I was eight. So I am pretty much from, you know, I, the good, the, 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 uh, the important years were spent in, uh, in Virginia, D.C. area. How did that move affect you? Um... I mean, we had moved, we were in New Jersey, so, I mean, how did that move affect me? I don't know. I mean, it was just kind of like, you know, had to roll with the punches, I guess. Um, so we had already moved the year before that from one town in New Jersey to another, um, and then moving just like another year, year and a half later to D.C., um, was pretty weird. I don't think I'd ever been to DC. And I remember telling my uh, third grade class, I was like, I'm moving to Washington, DC. And here is, this is the map of DC. And this is the Potomac River. Because I didn't even know how to pronounce that. Um, and we moved to a place called Fairlington, which is um, a townhouse development. But interestingly, and suppose, supposedly the first townhouse development, um, which are now, you know, of course, now you see them everywhere you go. Um, but, but Fairlington is from, I think, it's not even post-war. It's like during the war is when it was, was built. So I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's like the very southern tip of Arlington. No, not really. Um. So it's almost like you're, it's almost, it's kind of surrounded by Alexandria. So we're almost like more Alexandria than Arlington, but, um, but yeah, that's where I, that's where I, uh, grew up. <laughs> were, th were there a lot of kids in the neighborhood and were you, you know, um, were you kind of like an, an outgoing kid or were you mostly like, did you keep to yourself? Right. Um, I'm probably not really an outgoing kid, but I did have, yeah, there was tons of kids. It was like, um, even though I think the school system, there was definitely like a, a downward turn in the amount of kids because the Arlington County was closing schools constantly because there weren't enough kids. But the neighborhood was like filled with kids. You know, we play football and hang out and do whatever. And it was the 70s you know, 70s and 80s. So, uh, you know, your parents were never paying too much attention to you, so you could just go out and do whatever you wanted all the time, which was great. And, and what did you do? Did you uh, did you already play guitar at that point? 
Um, well, I was always super duper into music. So I was, you know, uh, whatever was on the top 40 radio when I'm, you know, we're talking about like nine or 10 or 11 years old. Um, top 40 radio was definitely a thing. I had no, there were no guitars in the house. Um, but I, our next door neighbor had an electric guitar and he would let me play it. And he didn't give me any instruction. He was just like, yeah, if you want to come over. And I'm like, you know, eight or nine years old or something. Um, so I would go over there sometimes after school. And this electric guitar weighed a ton. So it wasn't like something I could like actually pick up. I would just kind of sit there and have it on my lap and just kind of play around with it. Um, and then later when I was, I think I was 14, there was a sale it was probably in the newspaper or something. There was a sale at um, Harmony Hut at Springfield Mall for a uh, Epiphone guitar for $100. Nice. So me and my mom went down to Springfield Mall and picked it up. And I think she, I think I paid for the guitar and she bought the case, which was like an additional 30 or $40. So, <laughs> Pretty but I was deal. into... Uh, yeah, it was a great deal, and I, that's you know I I actually I actually sold that guitar unfortunately, but that was the guitar I used for years and years and years, and um, and actually I, re I bought another one because I missed it, um, but uh, but yeah, as far as music goes, um, I actually just listened to your uh, the Indian Summer podcast. <laughs> so, so I'm kind of well, uh, you're really, you're really an, up anticipating your 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 questions here. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, I go ahead. Mean, Sorry, I don't want to. I don't want to just keep rambling. If you have specific questions, you have. No, not really. I just, um, you know, I find your guitar playing style to be really interesting because uh, you you strum fast, like mm -hmm. very fast. And very rhythmically at the same time. You have, you know, this sort of uh, amazing ability to keep up uh, a rhythm at that speed. And mm -hmm. it must have been, you know, there, there must have been a lot of hours uh, building that up and being able to, to play like that. Yeah, I mean, once I got that guitar, I was, like, playing it all the time. Um I never took any lessons or anything like that, which is probably pretty common for uh, punk musicians. Um, I did take like violin in third grade, so I don't know if anything translated from that, but it was mostly just, you know, playing the guitar, playing, just making up songs, doing different tunings. Um, so as far as that, I mean, that fast rhythmic stuff, you're probably, I mean, a lot of that is, I mean, a lot of it's from, I mean, listen to, like, Lyle Presslar from uh, Minor Threat. I mean, that guy's a good guitar player. Probably just kind of evolved out of you know trying to play minor threat songs and things like that. So you you just called yourself a punk musician. You consider yourself a, a, a punk musician. And, um. And and, and I, when did that come about? Like you, you just mentioned minor threat too. Like when? Right. When did that start for you? Um. Well, I wouldn't consider myself a punk musician. I would just consider myself a musician. But um, uh, I guess like I knew about you know I listened to Top Forty Radio. Um, the band Kiss was gigantically huge when I was a kid, like in fifth and sixth grade. Um, it seemed like every kid liked Kiss, regardless of you know 
we, kind of regardless of anything. It was like every single kid in the school loved Kiss. Um, so I knew Kiss. Um, I got a, at some point, like a little bit older, I got a, a subscription to Rolling Stone magazine, and they had these advertisements for these Warner Brothers records called Lost Leaders. And they were like these double albums that you could uh, mail away for for only like two or three dollars. And so I got one of them, and it had like the Sex Pistols, Public Image Limited, Devo, Gang of Four, Wire, all on the same album. And that's that's, that's awesome. That, that's the only one. That, that's only just the stuff I can remember. I think it's like filled with tons of you know the Ramones were probably on there. Um, so I was like, wow, this is interesting. And my local record store was, I don't know if you remember Best Department Store. Yeah, sure. Um, so there was one in Shirlington, which was close to my house. And that was essentially my record store. Um, so pretty much all the stuff that I, that I heard on there I could go buy, assuming it was on like a major label, I could go down and buy it. So I had like a Gang of Four, Sex Pistols. So I was kind of like getting into this kind of learning about this whole thing. And then um, what happened after that? And then there was an article, there was a review in Rolling Stone for, it was kind of a group record review. So it was Public Image Limited and Joy Division. And so then I tried to try, then I had to track down the Joy Division stuff. And so this is all from like Rolling Stone magazine. Um, and I had n absolutely no idea that that there was, some sort of like underground uh, music scene that like kids were playing music. It was the only thing I was familiar with was like Kiss and Queen and things like that. And that, that seemed like uh, something that was unattainable. It was just like these people have been chosen to be our rock stars. And, you know, so I remember being at, um, at high school and this this girl who was I had been friends with since like third grade um, was like, oh, you know, you're really into punk, so you must know Minor Threat. And I'm like, I have no idea who Minor Threat is. Um, she's like, my mom is friends with bass player's mom or something like that. <laughs> and um, so I just kind of learned about that, and I was like, well, this is insane. Like, people are actually doing this, you know. At a, you know, kids are actually doing this. And then we were, uh, I would go to Georgetown every week because um, we actually went to church in Georgetown. Um, and at the other end of the block was uh, this store called, uh, what was the original name? Um, Record and Tape Limited, the book Annex, which later became Olson's. So I would be going in there and they had all the minor threats, seven inches, and all that stuff, and I started buying all that and just kind of um, opened my eyes, and then shortly thereafter was going to shows. So you went to church, and then you went to church. Exactly. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> so you started going to shows. What was, like, your first minor thread show or your first DC hardcore show? Right. Well, I was super-duper into Public Image Limited, and... Um, they were playing, I can't remember how I found this out. I think there was a, there was a senior, I was a freshman at Wakefield High School in Arlington. Um, and there was a senior who was in my class and he was like super into music as well, but he was into like journey and stuff like that. But then he was like, he's like, this public image concert is coming up. Because I guess I was, you know, I was always writing band logos on my notebook. So we, me and him would like start to talk about music, even though he, we were, there was essentially a gigantic age difference when you talk about high school. Um, but he was like, he was like public images playing. I was like, well, you got to be kidding me! I got to go to this. And um, and he's like, this band called Minor Threat is playing. And so I went there with him, and it was, you know, pretty mind blowing. That's cool that your mom let you go. Yeah, well, I think by then I was, that was like, I actually remember, I still have like a flyer from that. That's That was like October 1982. Um, 
So my mom had not, I mean, by then I was like 14 or 15. So before that, she had said no to going to the Kiss concert, going to Queen and things like that. Um, but I think once I was 14 or 15, you know, it's harder to uh, tell kids they can't do things by then. <laughs> did, you get, did you get in the pit? Did I get in the pit? I don't think so. No. I don't know if there was. There probably was a pit. Um, I well, think I think I was in a pit once at a 930 club show, and it was very unpleasant. So that was my last pit experience. What did you see in terms of the guitar playing? where you were like, you know, where where it might have inspired you? Um, I mean, just in terms of minor threat. I mean, I probably would say I was probably equally, if not more, inspired by uh, Keith Levine from Public Image. Um, I can hear that. And, uh, and then I was also super duper into this band that formed, I think shortly thereafter, um, after I saw that show called No Trend. Um, and which and they were kind of like in the style musically of uh, Public Image Limited. Um, and I would see them play probably like once a week because they were playing all the time. interaction in algebra class. She was expressionless at first, but then smiled to indicate submission. He rearranged his facial features to appear friendly. After determining that their popularity status was comparable, they decided that a relationship would be mutually beneficial. They were careful to be seen together in all the local fast food franchises. He had a stylized speech pattern. She used all the newest slang. When they talked on the telephone, they had trouble generating conversation stimulus. into their relationship to make their lives seem meaningful. They could act really mad, happy, or even sad, according to the current prefabricated social circumstance. They had copied all aspects of their behavior from what they had observed in society. At the school dance, they were careful to exhibit only behavior which had been approved by their peer group. And then I remember I was, there was a kid from my high school, because I think the drummer was actually from Arlington. Um, and his brother went to our high school. But he, um, I think the drummer went to, Michael Salkind went to H.B. Woodlawn, which was kind of like the alternative cool kids school. That's probably where all the punk rockers in Arlington were. Yeah. Was at Wakefield. He was playing in United Mutation, right? Was he in United Mutation? Okay. I mean, I, w I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, among other bands. Like, right, were, right, right, yeah. You know, when, yeah. It comes, when it comes to those bands, like guys yeah. were moving around and just like switching bands. And, yeah. You know. Right. Right. I'm sure I knew that and I've just forgotten that. <laughs> but. So in in terms of your high school, in terms of Wakefield, um, were there and did, were you able to discover like local bands that were you know playing um, at the time that were like high school bands? Were there you know high school shows? Or right. Like that in in your area. Right. Um, 
I, I think at HB Woodlawn, there was something going on, but I didn't know anything about that. Um, so at our school, there was, the, the, there was a high school band, and it was actually had that guy who I was talking about that took me to the Minor Threat show. And I think they were kind of like a um, – I wish I could remember the name of that band. They were kind of like a Journey cover band, kind of like uh, heavy metal, Van Halen, that kind of thing. Um, and then I started playing with these other guys who I met at school. And essentially back then, you know, you know – it was like, oh, you have a guitar, I have a guitar, let's play together. So I did play with these guys for like at least a year, um, probably. And we played Russian Van Halen songs, and which were not, not at all what I was into, really. Um, I was more of a Kiss Queen kind of guy. But um, then uh, I think it was an English class. We needed a drummer. So I think it was two guitar. I was like a rhythm guitar player. Then, then this uh, the other guy, John Borchers, uh, played lead, and then we had a bass player. We needed a drummer. So there was this guy in my uh, I think freshman English class who I knew was in the marching band. So I was like, "Do you play rock drums?" And so it was kind of all about like if you had the equipment, you know, let's play together. Um, so yeah, there were no other bands. There was just like our band that we you know that we were playing in this basement. And I do not remember any other high school bands whatsoever. There were like break dancing groups and things like that. Um and I, I feel like, you know, the other schools that were around us, I don't I don't think we had any contact with people that went to other high schools. What um, when did that when did that then evolve into unrest? Or um, right. Of it definitely involved into unrest because I think the the drummer and I kind of started. We found another guy who was into kind of more interesting music, um, and so we kind of left the two other guys, or that maybe they have, they might have graduated. Um, and then so we played, started playing with this other guy, and we kind of it was kind of more of a. Um, a trio where we would just switch instruments and we could just, we would just do whatever. And we didn't even really have songs. We would just kind of like jam or whatever, just kind of improv um, for a few hours at our parents', parents houses. Um, and that was the original lineup of Unrest. That was Phil Krauss was the drummer and Tim Moran was the bass player. And then, um, I think that was like 83, probably. And then by 84, I think we were like, we should play a show. Even though we're going to all these, I think by then we're going to, you know, punk shows every week um, in D.C., going to whatever, you know, going to shows all the time. And yet um, it didn't seem possible that we would ever be able to play one of those shows. So we were completely, you know, we were just um, observers, really. I mean, we were, you know, you know, we were there at the shows, but it didn't seem like it was an attainable thing to actually play at one of those shows. Um, Did you not think you were, you were good enough? Or what, what, what? Yeah, no, it was kind of like, oh, they are doing it. We can do it. But I didn't think, like... I don't know. Who do you talk to about playing a show? How does that happen? I don't know. We we don't know how that happens. And then every, I think all the people and I um, were just a little bit older too. So generally, so like when we saw, you know, Government Issue was playing constantly, um, and they were definitely older than us. They were they were like you know five to ten years older than us. So it seems like kind of like oh these adults can do this and um this is just not something that uh we would be asked to do um so yeah it just seemed like it just wouldn't happen like how does that happen i don't know i mean i still don't know (laughs) um but so what was so what would what did we do we so we played 
um, at our parents in our parents' basements, and eventually invited some friends over. Like, oh, we should have some friends can watch us play. So we had like you know five or ten people would come see us play in a basement, or um, and then like the school high school talent show came around, and like, oh, we should play at this high school talent show because where else are we going to be able to play? Um, so we did that. I think it was '84 and '85. We played the high school talent show, and then. We're also putting out these cassettes um, starting in 85. Um, and then I think, then after we graduated, uh, we did a recording session, like in a real studio, and put out a seven inch record. And that's when um, we, got a sh we got an offer to play a show. So. I guess that's how it happens. You put out a record, people listen to it. Because if you're just playing in your high school, in your basements, no one knows that you exist. <laughs> and that's why you're not getting an offer to play a show. So, um, I mean, it, it must have taken balls to, like, actually go to a recording studio, though, and, you know, you, ha you had to figure that out for yourself. How do we go to a recording studio? How do we put right. out a record? Yeah, I you feel know, like that stuff is... I feel like it's easier because it's something you can kind of control. Um, like how how did we find the recording studio and how did we find how to press a record? We looked in what was the internet of the day, which was the yellow pages. Um, so that's how we did that. Seems like if you if you you know if you could contact those people as long as you're paying if you're paying them money. They are more than welcome to uh, help you out. <laughs> Whereas the show, you know, you're not really offering them anything, I guess, really. We're right. an unknown band. Do you want us to play at your club? <laughs> yeah, although you could ask some other band and just be like, hey, can we open for you? Can we play a couple songs before you go on? Right, but I mean, yeah, I mean, it, that, it does seem very obvious. <laughs> <laughs> in, in retrospect, but you have to imagine being like 15 and going to these shows and the people yeah. you're watching on stage are kind of like unapproachable, like rock stars, even though they're like kids like you, they're kind of like, you know, I don't know. There was this kind of uh, awe and stardom in a way, I feel like. Oh, I know. I mean, I still, I, I still get that way interviewing, you know, the people that I, I grew up watching, even though they were, you know, they were local bands and, and guys just like me. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, any bands that, that I went to see when I was 14 or 15, when I get a chance to interview them, it's kind of crazy. Right, right, totally. So what, what was on that first seven inch? Um, it was, it was an unrest, uh, thing. It was a cover of the bird song. So you want to be a rock and roll star, which seems appropriate for a, for a single by band. Um, um, then there was an instrumental and then there was this, um, 
kind of this weird, um, not weird, but weird for what records were coming out at the time. It was just kind of like a very moody kind of, um, kind of new wave, almost progressive rock kind of synth thing on the, on the, on the, on the B side. And I think that's, and I think when people listened to the record, that was the thing that stood out was that song called, it was called The Hill. Joy Division. I would almost say it was more kind of like a, um, I don't know, new wave, synth pop, um, King Crimson kind of thing. <laughs> but but now that you say that, yeah, I think it it, it it could fit in there with the Joy Division. So, what the, the what would be considered like the first team beat releases? Was is is that considered a, a team beat release that that album yeah. or tape? Yeah. Well, that that single is team beat number seven. So that was um, that came out in I think November. That was I was in college when that came out. Um, so that was November of '85. The very first like uh, release that was uh, duplicated was February of '85 which was like a compilation tape. And before that, we did a bunch of Teen Beat things that were just one copy. Um, it was kind of like a lending library. So we just had one copy of everything. Uh, we didn't know how to uh, duplicate cassettes at the time. We didn't have the equipment or the know-how. You didn't have a money. boom box? <laughs> a what? A boom box. Well, we had a boombox to record it, but how do you make a copy of that? Tape? No, I mean a boombox with like two tapes. A boom yeah, box that's. Is like, with like I don't remember those. Text, text, I don't think those existed. Oh, I don't wow. think those existed. At that time, really? Like in 1984? I don't know. Yeah, maybe maybe they did. I remember my brother having one in like '86. Right. So, I mean, we had to get when we finally figured it out. We had to get two separate tape decks and hook them up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what people did, or you know, you you would you would tape something off of the record. So you'd like play the record and have like a <laughs> set up next to the to the record. Oh right, yeah, exactly. Just through the air, of course. Yeah. yeah, totally. So you probably could have done that with with two tape decks, not even like you know. Right. Not even plugging them into one another, but right, right. Recording we were in the air. We were audiophiles, though. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but but the unrest stuff that you put out on tape, you you had before you did the the album. Like, how many how many unrest tapes did you have? Um, I mean, essentially, what we did would you know we would just uh, record our rehearsals on like a boom box. Um, and then we would take like, Oh, some of this sounds good. Some of, sometimes it was just like an entire rehearsal tape, like before we did the, the actual, uh, duplicated releases. Um, it would just be like an unedited rehearsal tape. Um, and then once we figured out how to, how to make copies and edit, um, uh, and you know, then we started releasing these things. Um, so I would say there was two unrest albums earlier that year before we made the seven inch single. So one of them had like you know 
12 songs. The other one has like, I don't know, 24 songs. It's like a hour long event. <laughs> and that stuff is, is really great. Like I love oh, thank it. You. Thanks. Yeah. I, it, it reminds me of, you know, like now listening to it, it kind of reminds me of like, uh, Ween, like some of their uh -huh. albums where it's just like, you know, like, like a hodgepodge of all these different genres. Totally. And, and, and different yeah. stuff. And, you know, there are, there are songs that remind me of like early replacements mm. on there. Cool. And, you know, there, there's, there's all kinds of stuff. Yeah. I mean, that was kind of our thing. That was kind of like, let's not repeat ourselves. You know, we'll do like a country song and then we'll do a rock song and then a pop song. That was that was kind of what we were trying to do. Yeah, there's um, one where it's like the last song on one of the sides where you do it like this, like there, it's, it's this like organ song where it's almost okay. like this like like 50s like kind of mm -hmm. like organ song i don't know it what sounds like us to all sorts of stuff we were going to like uh orpheus records in georgetown and just buying they had tons of cut oh, out releases yeah. that were like four or five dollars and so we were listening to like henry cow and uh king crimson and and all sorts of things in addition to all the local band releases that were coming out and stuff like that yeah, I, I should also say um, just one little footnote is that we actually released uh, a pre-Ween, before Ween existed, we released a Ween uh, cassette on Team Beat. <laughs> oh, wow. Like in 1987. It's called Synthetic Socks. Right, yeah. 
I think that's I think that's true to a point. Yeah, I mean, essentially, we were just having fun playing music, and we like to play different kinds of music. Yeah, like it wasn't for, so. Yeah, I, I mean, in terms of putting out a a hit album, it's hard to have, you know. <laughs> it's it's hard to have a huge amount of fans that way when people mm-hmm. don't know people don't know what to expect from one song to the next of what you're gonna mm-hmm. do. True, yeah. People okay. people get very confused by something like that. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean obviously when we're doing it we're just thinking this song is good, I like that song and you know I don't know. I don't think it occurred to us that we should, uh, I don't know, play one genre of music or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, you could have been maybe a bit more discerning about what you put out. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, along with some some songs that are confounding, you know, there there is obviously... Uh, a gift for songwriting and for and for songcraft in there. Even you know, like I said, even in the the earliest unrest stuff, it's definitely there. You think I'm turning around? the pain all in your head it stops the pain all in your Yeah, I think I think once you start like this, you know, quote record label or whatever it was, um <laughs> and you're kind of in charge of it and your band is is creating material for it, you just release anything and everything you can get your hands on, really. So, I think anytime Unrest was, was rehearsing, we would always be recording it and we would always be releasing it regardless of what it sounded like. <laughs> well, so what about other bands? Like, how did how did it come about that you started releasing other people's stuff? Um, well, there was kind of a, it was kind of a group of people at high school. So there was a guy in my like, government class who he was actually from. He had he had originally gone to H. B. Woodlawn, which was the cool kid school. And now he was at Wakefield. Um, so he was in a band already that, you know, they had actually played gigs and they smoked and drank beer and stuff, all things that were alien to me. Um, and so they were on, it's like, yeah, let's put you guys on on our on our compilation cassette. And then the, within the group of people at school you know we were all in these kind of side projects so there was unrest and then you know um tim and phil and this guy ian zach played together you know with ian's band the uh thirsty boys and then me and phil would get together and we'd do this thing called clearance and so it was kind of just a lot of and then there was another guy at high school that played music and we're like yeah let's put your stuff out so you know within this group of probably only I don't know, eight or nine people at high school, we probably had, I don't know, like six different bands, quote bands, you know. Wait, wait. You know, they weren't really bands. They were just people playing music in their basements or, you know, that kind of thing. Well, what's a band other than people playing music in their basement? Yeah, right. 
I mean, I guess I guess some of these things were kind of like there is no drummer, there is no bass player, you know. So I, I guess at the time it didn't seem like it was, I don't know, a real thing or whatever. But that didn't stop us. XUShots.com is an independent publishing company specializing in vintage and contemporary media about the Washington D.C. punk rock scene. XUShots.com produces high-quality, limited-edition merchandise for the discerning punk rock connoisseur. Now listen in on this case study so you, too, can experience the unexpected when you have XUShots.com in your life. Mm, is that a limited-edition Jams for Man t-shirt from XUShots? Why, yes. I was lucky to get one because only 24 were ever made. Oh... Uh, that's so hot. It makes me want to hum. Er, uh, let's do it. XUShots.com Oh my god. That Jams for Man t-shirt from XUShots is so Warhol. It makes me want to blow your kiss. Mmm. Mm, sounds inviting. But my door doesn't swing that way. Thanks for the offer. What the? What the? What? Hey! Ah! Ah! Get that dog off my leg! Remember, that's X U S H O T S dot com. X U Shots dot com. Where everybody loves you. How did you how, how did you find other bands like uh, Tuscadero and uh, Velocity mm-hmm. Girl? Because you weren't um, you weren't still in high school at that point with the, the right. I know, right? Right. So I went to college. I went to the University of Maryland. Um, I went there because they had a college radio station, and I didn't want to leave like the DC scene at the time. So that's where I went to school. Um, And I think, so we put out that single, then we did, I think two years later, it was kind of a really long process. We did the first Unrest album, like an LP. And... Is that the back part? No, it's called, um, it doesn't really have a title. It's like the first album. Um... We could not afford real printed covers, so what I did was I bought a thousand blank record covers, and I had friends decorate them. Um, so a lot of people at like the radio station at University of Maryland uh, decorated them, uh, which was great. I um, never heard of bubble jug. They did the same thing. Okay, yeah. So it was like, yeah, it's not uncommon because. You know, it's ex- it was ex- very expensive to uh, put a record out. But once we and did that... And it's so um, cool that then every single one is a collector's item because every single one is, is unique and different, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, I know, we've been thinking about... It's been out of print, you know. Ascend- well, we did do... There was a reissue of it in the 90s under with a different title as kind of a, as a compilation but it's been out of print for a pretty long time and now i feel like if it if it's reissued the obvious way to do it is to buy those a thousand uh blank jackets again but it's a very daunting task um so we did that record and then i think you know at that point you would just you know if you had an actual record out back then you could just call up a distributor and they would say, Oh, I'll take 20, I'll take 30, whatever. And then if you were lucky, the people working at the distributor would listen to it because then they, you know, generally would. Um, and then if people at the distributor liked it, they would kind of push it and then they would order lots more. So with that first unrest LP, um, these uh, people at Caroline Records Distribution um, like really loved it. Uh, and then from there, so we just, you know, sold all those um, and from there kept putting records out. Um, 
And I think, like I said, we, you know, we did that early Ween cassette. Um, so at that point, you know, I don't, I guess through fanzines and things, your name and your address is getting out there and people are sending you things. So, um, that's how we did the Ween thing. Although we, we haven't really released much as far as things that weren't like by friends of ours. Um, but, you know, eventually we're putting out lots of records like by like 1990, 91, um, just by like, you know, like eggs, like you're saying, um, Johnny Cohen's Love Machine, who was like a local band, uh, Butch Willis. Um, and then you were asking how I knew about Velocity Girl. I went to I went to University of Maryland with all those people. Um, and, you know, we didn't, we, I think we released one of their songs on a compilation, but, uh, but uh, Bridget, who was in Velocity Girl and in Unrest, um, she was actually a high school student and was a listener to my radio show at the University of Maryland at WMEC. And that's how I got to know her. Um, and then Tuscadero, uh, they opened up her eggs like an at 15 minute club one night. So it's just like things like that, you know, cause you would meet people and say, you know, Oh, let's put out a record or whatever. Well, you had good years too, in terms of, you know, like figuring out and being aware of like who had something, you know, who had something going on just to see an open yeah. band like that, like Tuscadero or to, um, receive you know just like a demo from ween and just like no yeah th this is this right is i wouldn't say that we were like listening like uh i wouldn't it wasn't like a situation where i was you know like thinking like i'm an a and r guy and i gotta figure out what the next big thing is i was saying no, it was more like good. i was more like i like this let's put a record out <laughs> Which yeah. is essentially the whole label, because we're not, you know, because we all we're putting out Tuscadero, but we're also putting out um, like an eggs side project called Viva Satellite, which, you know, not as not nearly as many people listen to, but you know, we still liked it, so we were putting it out. Or Butch Willis, who we love, um, but you know, has never achieved any uh, sort of uh, large record sales. So unrest when when Bridget joined the band did that did that solidify something for you guys or was it you know just kind of a a new direction for you? Mm -hmm. um, I feel like the direction. I mean, we were definitely. I guess what happened was we had released that first album. And by then, by the time we had recorded that, that was like 1986, we were all in college. So we were, we were recording during the summers. Um, so it's not really a band, like a, a, it's not a regular band. And then we did a couple records with Caroline Records and I think Tim was in Michigan. So we needed somebody local. So this guy, Dave Park, was our bass player. Um, and he was in Harrisonburg, Virginia, James Madison University with Phil. Um, but yeah, again, I'm in, Mar you know, I'm in DC and these guys are way out in Virginia and it's still, you know, we're, we're playing shows occasionally, but it's still not really a full band. Um, and then I think with our third album, Custom Carnal Black Exploitation, um, it was kind of like a, there was a lot of, we tried to, usually we tried to make the albums very eclectic, like lots of different genres, like we, like we discussed before. And I think with that one, we kind of, the whole thing is a little more trending towards like hard rock, heavy metal kind of stuff. Um, and I think when that happened, kind of Phil and I were kind of like ready to do something different. So we did a bunch of recording uh, it was just me and Phil. So I think I played the bass on it. Um, we did this single called uh, Cherry Cherry for this English record company. Um, 
it was it's not a record company it was like you know a friend of ours who had, had a small label um and so that was kind of uh that that new direction of sound was that single and then I think Bridget had left Velocity Girl and it seemed perfect because I'd been friends with her for a few years and it seemed perfect for her to join the band um, musically and and then it definitely solidified the lineup because then we were all in DC at that point. We had, you know, uh, Phil had graduated. Um, I had like dropped out and um, it definitely, we were definitely like a regular band at that point. So yes. <laughs> It was a little long way of saying yes. It solidified it to line the line up. And it seems like more of your top 40 pop sensibility comes to the fore at that point. Yeah, I think what we did, I think what happened was, you know, as I said, like we were, it was getting, that that third album was so heavy that it was time to do a little more pop music. And I've always loved pop music. And we've always, you know, those those types of songs, I think were always there. Um, yeah, even back to like disco magic. Right, the songs were always there, all those pop songs, but you know, all this other stuff was in there too. And I guess even you know, even when Bridget joined and we did the Imperial album, there's still like, there's really only like maybe four pop songs on a ten song album. So you know, even even for that album, which people think is like an indie pop record, is has a lot of weird stuff on it that's not indie pop at all. Oh yeah, no, you 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 still have the the, the weird side, right, <laughs> to you. But I think that you know you you had said, and we had started off that before you even got a guitar, you were listening to you were listening to Top Forty. You, you know, you had oh, yeah. you, you had that that side to yourself. You, I mean, for God's sake, the first band you loved was Kiss. Right. <laughs> Yeah. I so. To them. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. I mean, you, you you said yourself you were more on the Kiss Queen side. Well, right. you know, those those bands rock, and there's also a real pop sensibility to them. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And so you know, it it makes right. Sense. And I was also into. Um... Sorry. Go ahead. I was saying it would make sense you guys would have a song like Suki, you know? Right. Right. Um and, and again, your your rhythm guitar, you know, is what I think stands out considerably on the song. 
It, you know, that's what, that's what makes them so um, like danceable. Mm, cool. I mean, obviously, you have to have the rhythm section underneath you. You have to you have to have that turning along. But you mm-hmm. have that you you have this like danceable guitar style in you. Mhm. Yeah, I don't know how. Yeah, I don't know how conscious any of that stuff was, but yeah. Well, it doesn't. You know, it doesn't have to be conscious. I don't right. think like you know. I think all of us are to some extent like a, a, a Cuisinart of all this music that you pour into us. Right. You know, and right. then when you play it just it just comes out. Whatever whatever comes out comes out. And it's yeah. some sort of, of mix of all that music that goes in. Right. I totally agree. Um but I think it yeah, it's I feel like yeah, definitely the the, the stuff that really maybe sticks, I feel like it's more influential than anything else. It's probably the stuff I, w- I was listening to when I was like nine or 10. Yeah. Just like yeah. 40. Yeah. And it stays with you. That's right. Stuff that you, the stuff that you listen to going into your teen years, like when you first sort of discover music and music becomes your own and you, you know, you, you have your own records or tapes mm-hmm. or, or CDs. Or now MP3s for some kids. Um, going through, you know, the, your your teen years and, and and when you go to college, like that's that's what sticks with you the most. Right. Definitely. Yep. I concur. So, how long? You said you didn't want to leave the um, the DC scene, and and I would. I would extend that to say the Northern Virginia scene, because mm-hmm. <laughs> that's a show that focuses um, on Virginia. Right, but, I know your show does. I was thinking about that when I was listening to the other episodes, um, because I yeah I didn't want to leave the DC scene. I don't know if there was. I mean, you would know better than I. But I feel like as far as my world goes, the Virginia scene was. Arlington Record and Tape Exchange in North Arlington. And then and then later, you know, there was Discord House and there was, you know, and then Teen Beat was there and Simple Machines was there. So when I think of the Northern Virginia scene, I think of it being more of a um, a 90s thing. Whereas as far as like the hardcore stuff, like those, the hardcore shows that like in Burke, Virginia, like that was really kind of. I think I maybe went to one or two of those shows, but that was uh, kind of alien to me in a way. Well, it could be a combination of things. I think it's um, it's where the people are from. Yeah. You know, in the scene, it's not just. Yeah. It's not necessarily where the um, the shows are held. Sure. And and certainly there were enough places that were in Arlington or Alexandria. Or you know whatever, or like you're saying, Burke or Cedar Crest or any any of the places that the people were having shows, you yeah, know, that, were, that were in Virginia. Right. I just feel like I have gone to hardly any shows, and I mean, up until uh, like Galaxy Hut, I had attended very few shows in Virginia. Yeah. Well, I mean, my experience, <laughs> my experience my experience is different because Reston kind of had its own insular scene too. Okay. Yeah. 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 So you know, we had a scene that was like you were talking about, like basements and garages and stuff like that, and seeing bands in basements and garages. We yeah. had a scene that revolved around basements and garages, and right. then and then kind of like the community center and the high school and and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I know that exists. I know that existed. I just, I just was not. I was either oblivious to it or I was just uh, too far away. Like the metro didn't go there. <laughs> yeah. Now it does. Now it does. Right, 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 right. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, all the all the labels, or at least a lot of the labels that were important to me, were were based in Northern Virginia. 
Yeah, yeah. Yep. Right. You know, so DSI and, mm-hmm. and Teambeat and Torque and Discord and, you know, like you said, Simple Machines, all of these are Northern Virginia labels. They all have Northern right. Virginia, you know, addresses. Yep. They're Northern Virginia houses. They're Northern Virginia people. Right. So, you know, people may people may associate you with the D.C. scene, and certainly growing up, whenever I got outside of Virginia to make things easier on myself, like when I told people where I was from, I said I was from D.C. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think a lot of people said that rather than Northern Virginia. When I told my relatives back from New York, you know, that I'm from Northern Virginia, they would say, do you have cows? Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. So, and so it became, I, I realized, you know, it became a lot easier to just say, no, 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 no. I'm from D.C. And then they would, they, they yeah. would get what that meant a lot more. Right. And I think that makes sense. I mean, if you're from, you know, I mean, any city, you know, oh, I'm from New Jersey, but I'm really 10 minutes from Philadelphia or whatever. You know, yeah. it just kind of makes sense. You are from the, the metropolitan area or whatever. But I totally agree with the Virginia pride. You know, we, you know, that whole, you know, there was definitely a lot of Arlington, Virginia pride going on with the whole team beat thing. So, Well, how long do you think that scene basically continued for, for you? The scene that you kind of didn't want to leave when you went mm-hmm. uh, to, to Maryland. What you know, what were the years of that scene, and and how long did that last for you yourself? Um, I mean, it kept evolving. I mean, it was there until I moved away from D.C. You know, I mean, it just evolved into different things all the time. I mean, it was always it was always there. I think it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> And maybe the punk, maybe the punk thing was, maybe that didn't just start. Maybe that was evolving from whatever was happening in the '60s or whatever too. I don't, you know, obviously I don't really know that much about that. But. Yeah, I mean, there's there's stuff like Black Market Baby and Insect Surfers sure. and Tex Rabinowitz yep. and yep. you know stuff that I've only discovered now going back. Yeah, Roy Clark. Um, there was the Insect Surfers were on a label called Wasp Records, which was run by the guy who did Arlington Tape Exchange um, out of his house, which which now is uh, you know office building. So it was right next to the Boston Metro. Yeah, I mean that stuff really goes back a long way too, and 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 now like what. Like what's the what is the mission of Teen Beat now, or what is where where are you with with the label and in terms of music yourself and, and creating and playing mm-hmm. music? Um, well, the label is pretty much operates the way it always did. Um, I guess we I guess I would say we don't release a lot of new bands. Um and mostly because we always kind of just released music by our friends and our friends just aren't in new bands as much anymore. Um as as much as they were back then. Um I perform with my wife in a a cappella group called Cotton Candy. Um and I also do this thing called Fang Wizard with um, this guy Trevor, who is he's also a Northern Virginia scene guy. Um, he lived at the Simple Machines house. He did a band called Holland. So um, I play music with him probably every six months or so. We get together at his house in D.C. Um, and what else? And we also, I made a movie about bringing it back to your profession uh, about Butch Willis. I don't don't know if you're familiar with Butch Willis. I I am. I've I've, I've listened to to all the stuff on on Teen Beat pretty much. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I made a movie of his, and it will actually be playing 
at Zebulon in Los Angeles. So I hope you can come see it. <laughs> yeah, I'd love um, probably, to check that out. Probably in December. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I was, you know, I'm actually thinking right now. You know, it's a lot of like trying to get some of the back catalog out there on vinyl, um, and maybe reissuing um, those earliest cassettes on cassette, like the way they were when they originally came out. So things like that. <laughs> and I'd like to do a book as well. So, but just a, a kind of more of a um, a visual. A visual book of like all the releases or something like that it would be kind of cool. That sounds so, great. Yeah, I that, know, that is a great about... idea. Well, it sounds like you're keeping it going and doing a lot of cool stuff still. And yeah. Uh, yeah. I right. I look forward to um to getting a chance to to see that film and to to see you in person in December. Cool. Yeah. So that would be I'm great. Do that. I uh, I really appreciate you uh, taking all this time talk to me this morning no problem thanks for having me you were the very first one you were the first one 